again, welcome everyone. Um, so we had a few minutes to, as we're getting set up to this, uh, think about this question. So, so do neural networks have memory? So, I mean, we've we said before that neural networks are might are very might uh, be resemble the brain a little bit. Um, really, not really. Yes, but actually, no. Depends on how you think about it. But do they actually have like memory? Kind of maybe like how humans do. Any thoughts on that? I mean, maybe not in the same manner exactly. Not in the I same. Guess, I guess the, there's theoretically a way that you could I guess, store like the weights and stuff at some points. So storing weights at some points, like in time, I, or after a certain like number of like epochs or whatever. So you can say that counts, it, it, like whatever the neural network's learning, you can count that as the weights as like its memory? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's a good idea. I like that. Uh, any other thoughts on that? Because remember, and maybe, maybe this might help you, remember that neural networks, you know, their whole purpose is, is to approximate some function that we don't know. And that function can be anything to relate any type of data to some type of output that we're expecting. So is it... Um, and we've also talked about overfitting, where we say overfitting could be like the network memorizing the training data. But is it like memory, or what? It, like what's actually going on there? Any other thoughts on that? It's okay to take a minute to think. It's an, in it's a, it's an interesting question. Because th that's why I have this, like, this little in parentheses here. Can they recall previous data? So if you input a piece of data, can the, can the neural network actually say, hey, I've seen that data. Like, I recall this data, piece of data. Yeah, Dylan? Don't they only feed things forward? Right, they feed things forward. They, but they also do backpropagation, too. So we also go back through it. So maybe it's somehow like remembering the data that it's been trained on through backpropagation. That could be an idea. Any other thoughts? Yeah, over here. Don't the, um, the weights only change during the training phase? Right. Not during the evaluation. Yeah, so, so when, when you're actually testing, the weights are, are, are static. Yeah, they're, they're already been, they should already hopefully be good weights where you get some good accuracy and output. So yeah, so they only get updated during that propagation during the training phase. Any other ideas? Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't really make sense to say that they have memory if the goal of the neural network is to just approximate some type of regression model or function. That's it's that's that's a very good point. It's it saying they have memory is uh, or I would say it's along the same lines of saying like some function or some math function like y equals x mm -hmm. <laughs> knows um each data point that it can possibly contain. So that's a very uh, that's a very interesting point. So you're saying that neural networks don't have memory. Yeah. They're just you, they're just some they're just akin to like a function like y equals x. Yeah. It's a very good point. Um, and we'll we'll see the answer to this in just a few minutes. But those are some very very interesting points everybody made. So um, and I don't want to spoil it yet. So we'll go into it. Um, but this week. Current neural networks in this headline in the show anyway is going to go to our workshop because uh, our workshop we're actually going to be writing some Simpson scripts uh, for the show, so it's going to be pretty cool. Um, yeah, so let's get started. So review of kind of what we've been over so far, just the neural network wise. Um, so we have ANNs, or just regular, or just called N neural networks. Um, so what what are these models good at? So this is our our first introduction to neural networks and um, and deep learning. Uh, so what are, so what do these like uh, types of this, uh, fully connected layers, as we call them, dense layers, linear layers? What are these? Uh, what are these models good at? <coughs> Maybe you can remember the workshops we did and the type of data sets we used. Is it structured data? Structured data, right? That's that's very important. Um, they can work with unstructured data, but it's a lot harder to to work with that. But yeah, that's a good point. So they work a lot better with structured uh, data. Any other thoughts? What they're good at? You said something over here that started with R. What was that? Mm -hmm. oh, regression. Regression. Yeah. So they're they're good with with doing regression, being able to output some type of continuous 
uh, value and adding to estimate instead of just like classification. That's a good one. Any other thoughts? Okay. All right. Well, those are those are some good things. So classification, regression, they're good with structured data, which wasn't on here, so that's a good point. Um, rec basically, recognizing patterns in data and estimating some function. You know, <coughs> like I said before. So now, and then after that, we're like, okay, well, you know, neural networks can't solve everything. Just regular neural networks. The issue there's a, there's quite a few issues with it. And that's where CNNs came in to help try to solve some of those issues for different uh, domains. And by domains, I mean like just different areas of like where data, like so like domains of image, like domain could be images or like um, text data, you know, things like that. So what what were CNNs really good at? Images. So images, yes. So like you see, CNNs are most popular for any type of image data. What else? Maybe something a little bit more broad. You said structured. So what do you think CNNs are good at? Unstructured data. Yeah. yeah. So anybody, uh, who knows the difference like between structured and unstructured data? Like, raise your hand. Does nobody know the difference? You don't know? Thank you. So more organized? All right. Yeah, that, um, yeah, that, that is. It's like organized into uh, different pieces. So really, by, f by structured data, um, and what uh, Danny covered last time, um, when you have unstructured data, each data, po a data point in, in your data, if it's unstructured, doesn't really mean anything on its own. So like, again, a pixel in an image, if you take an image and take one pixel, that pixel doesn't mean anything to you. You're like, okay, it's, just a, it's a color, but it, doesn't, but it needs all the pixels around it to actually get some type of information out of it. And structured data is something like tabular data or like data in a spreadsheet. Because if you take one piece of data, that data is a complete like piece of data. It's all the information you need. Some real world significant significance to that piece of data. So that's a good one. Yeah. I don't know if this is um, accurate or not, but I saw somewhere that it's like it's better at seeing trends and it's almost better at like looking at a set of data without anything relationship or set it off together and just seeing the relationship. You're talking <coughs> spatial relationships. Is that what you're thinking of? It's like data that data that's around each other. They 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 have some relation. No. Not sure. Honestly, I, right. I, 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 well, well, the spatial relationship is one thing that unstructured data has. Is unstructured data relies on the data around it in order to get gain information, and so that's what the answer is for. So um, a main point here is feature extraction. That's a that's a huge you know word we kept using it over and over again. Um, you have like an image, or you have some piece of data, and there's features inside of it. Whether what those features can just be simple, like you know, detecting like like uh, horizontal lines, colors, you know, things like that, or more complex features like hands, faces, you know, dogs, ears, you know, you know, things like that. So that's what they're really good at taking your unstructured data and being able to extract features and information from that by if, and. It uses spatial correlation for that. So it takes groups of pixels and then uses that information to extract features. And, I, and what does it use? So it uses convolution because it's in the name. But what, are, what, are the, what were the uh, things that we used to actually uh, uh, extract features from? Like the, the matrix, what was the name for that? Filter. Filter? Yes, that's a good one. Uh, it's also called kernels. But yeah. So the main point here is localizing features. So being able to so if so say if a hand appears in the corner of the image, if that if that hand appears in like say say the pan, hand appears in the top right, and then that same hand appears in the bottom left in a different image, the neural network will still be able to recognize the hands in the image because it local it be able to extract the feature no matter where it is in the image. For you guys over here, since this projector is kind of sad, you, you feel free to move over here if you want. So, so you know. Um, all right. So the last point that I want to make here before we get into RNNs, what, so we've been talking about all this type of data, structured, unstructured, but what, so each piece of data, what is it assumed to be in relation to each other? So there's a word I'm looking for here. So you have one piece of data, you input it, you have another piece of data, you input it, so what's the relationship between those pieces of the data? Yeah? There is no relation. There is no relation. All right, so any other ideas? Maybe agree or disagree. 
maybe there's some relation. I mean, the two pieces of data are probably from the same domain. Like if you're training on dog images, both images are probably dogs. So you can train on those. But if you input one piece of data, is it, is it like really related to the next one or not? So he said no. Maybe any other ideas? Like more of an independent thing? Yes. Well, that is the word I'm looking for. So you got it right. Independent of each other. So by independence, I mean there's no sequence to the data. If you input one image of a dog, for example, and you input another image of a dog, sure they're both dogs, but that but the first image you you, you put into the network does not uh, the second image does not depend on that. Does that make sense? Like if I put in one image and I put in another image, those two images don't depend on each other for the network to make a correct output. It can make a correct output just with one image. Any questions on that? Oh, good. All right. All right. So now do we uh, understand like the different types of data and sequence? This is where RNNs come into play when we have sequential data, or co also called time series, which is also our next uh, workshop next, or not next week, the week after. Next week's going to be applications, um, which we'll go more in depth into the, these type of uh, data sets. But um, RNNs actually have memory built in a network architecture. So um, whoever whoever said that they don't, I think it was you, that said they don't have um, they don't have memory. You're correct. So they approximate some function, but they're but the m the network has no idea of data it's seen before. It's learned from data it's seen before, but it can't be like, oh, I've learned from this exact piece of data, or I've seen this before. But RNNs have that power. They have the power to be able to relate pieces previous data to the current data it's processing. And that's what make them. That's what makes them really powerful. So. Um, just like how CNNs are really popular with, um, uh, you know, image data and stuff, what are what are what do you think would be some popular applications for uh, for RNNs? So think time series data. So something with time that that some type of data that relates that requires time in order to make sense of it. Videos. Videos. That's yeah. That's a really good one. My personal favorite. Sound. Sound. So yes. So you you know somebody's talking you know if you have word if somebody's talking and, and um, you have to relate to whatever the current sound is to the previous sound to be able to make sense of what's actually going on so that's important anything else yep also like supply demand it's so uh, they consider like the monster they are a monster. so like some type of economic data yeah, yeah. so like most economic data is over time so that, yes that's really really good application any other ideas. Stonks, yes. <laughs> so that's economic data, stocks. So stocks are a really popular domain uh, for RNN to try to, because you know, if you can solve the stock market, you just you know, take over the world. Because <laughs> you can just basically buy any stock and always win money. Um, but yeah, those are all really good. So uh, speech recognition, kind of like sound. So you know, your uh, Amazon Alexa, uh, your wiretap on, on live, and uh, you have Siri and or Google Assistant, like all those, you know, they all use some form of like recurrent neural networks to be actually be able to process your speech and be able to recognize, you know, as well as well as it does. Um, traffic patterns, stock prices, those are really good. Like, I think UCF could use some nice traffic uh, analysis around here to <laughs> help out. Maybe build some more roads. No, nowhere to build more roads. Um, a big thing is natural language processing. So that kind of goes into speech recognition, but also text. So that's a huge domain for to be able to actually process text. Um, and be able to, to do either generate text, which we're going to be doing in our workshop today, or be able to classify or do some type of other prediction on it. Um, and gesture recognition, which is, you know, then I can also just be like videos. Videos are really good for that, but a good domain for that is gesture recognition. Because recognition. what you can do with that is you can do um, some type of like action analysis, like classification. Like if some, is somebody walking, are they running? Are they stealing a car? So, and those are important because, like, you know, you can maybe can have cameras that can actually predict crimes, which is a huge, it's a like, big research field. Uh, they're called anomalies, be able to uh, detect crimes happening, like, in real time, and, you know, they're police and stuff. So, yeah, it's, they're really powerful, and they're really awesome. You know, NLP is, besides computer vision, is one of my favorite domains to work in, so it's pretty awesome. Uh, we're going to go over some different types today. So we're going to go over simple RNNs and uh, LSTMs. Um, it's okay if you don't know these. We'll you know go over them. 
Uh, there's also a third one which I'll mention on the side, but we're not going to go over it today, but I encourage you to look in after the workshop. There's some uh, resources at the end of these uh, slides that have a bunch of links to different things. All right, you guys ready to get started? Yeah. All right, so let's look at simple RNNs, see how they work. So the whole, uh, the main, th the main addition we're making to the general, <coughs> like the neural network architecture, you know, you saw like with this basic neural networks is that we're gonna introduce these things called states. These states are the output of the last state's hidden layer, the service inputs in the following step. So what does that mean? States are basically, um, States are just basically what, at that node, what was like the, it kind of saved information about what the input data was and what the activation was that's then passed into the next state. So the state can, uh, so the next state can actually relate uh, back to the previous information and the states and the activations that it's seen before. Um, so, and this is called the folded model right here, and we're going to unfold this and make it, make, make a little more sense if you're confused now. Um, but we have our input X, uh, you know, our weight matrix here, Wx, our state, which loops in on itself, so that's what the arrow means, because the state, every state just keeps, um, because um, when, because this is folded, so it's not, uh, all the states are just uh, looping in on themselves, so they're kind of, so if you unfold that, they'll go over time, which we'll see in a second. And then it's weight matrix, and then we have our output in its weight matrix as well. So what does this mean? Let's un so as I said, let's unfold this. So we unfolded this model, and this is so we have a uh, time going along here, and we have some different states. So observations. I'm not asking anything specific, but what do you observe about what's going on here with this uh, <coughs> with this uh, this uh, unfolded model here? What was that? Right, so we have, so now we have time. Before, you know, I know that works, they don't care about time. They, you know, maybe time to train, but not actually in the model. So we actually, this, the state, it, our state of our model was based on time. Yep. The input and output weights seem to be independent of each other, while the weight state seems to be dependent on the previous weight. The so weight's drawn at least. That, that's, a, that's a really good observation, and the weight states are actually stay the same. So they, so what, so the, this thing is starting to lose power here. So the interesting thing is, is that as weight uh, weight matrix for y, the state and x, they they stay the same with each time step. They don't actually update or change throughout the time steps. So that's an important observation. What does change with every state, every time step? And here, time step can be whatever time is, like seconds, minutes, was whatever the time step is. You put an output. Yes, so the imp we get a different input for every state, and we also get its corresponding output at every state, and it's different for each time. Anything else? Yeah? The states itself change. Right. The states themselves. Yeah, so we get a new state um, with uh, every time step that's also based on the previous states. So every state is dependent on all the states previous to it. And that's all the states. So if this was S in million, it will be based on... S, you know, 900,999, you know, all the way down to zero. We'll see why that might be a problem in just the next slide. So you guys all hit some, uh, some really good points with that. Um, here, we're going to see these functions again uh, just in a second here because um, this is going to be important how we actually train this. So this is just saying, like, what the state is. So it's just pretty much things you've seen before. It's just our activation function plus... You know, our input times the weight matrix times the previous state times the weight matrix. So that's what the activation of the current state is. So as you can see, it's based on the previous state. And then our output is just the activation of our state times the weight matrix. And then that gets our output. So pretty, um, pretty similar to the things we've seen before, except now we have this extra state included in. So that's cool for the feed forward, but how do we actually train these? We can't just back propagate because we have multiple states. Because each state is dependent on the last one. If you try to back propagate the state three, then you somehow need to get the state two and state one and you know all that stuff. So what do we use? We use back propagation through time. I mean, it's pretty obvious through time. So it's this back propagation, but we're just, we're gonna go through time as well. So we're gonna back propagate through every state and update the uh, and use all of the previous states to be able to update the weight matrix at this current time step. So let's get started here. So there's going to be some math. 
but don't worry. Uh, who knows what partial derivatives are? Okay, so most people, maybe a little iffy. That's fine. You really don't need to understand, you know, uh, the, how to calculate a partial derivative. Just know that partial derivative is basically, um, in our case, it's going to be calculating the slope or the gradient with, res with respect of one variable to another. <coughs> and we'll see what that is in a second. So let's, let's uh, set some things. So these are the functions here again. So we're going to be back propagating with regards to you know, these functions. And activation in this case is whatever activation is being used. So it could be, you know, ReLU, uh, tan H, sigmoid, you know, things like that. So let's get started. So the easiest one, we're going to update um, our weight matrix for Y. So if we're looking at this, all, all we're doing here is um, our, our gradient update, which is going to be the partial derivative of the error at time step three with respect to the weight matrix Y. Is this going to be the error with respect to the actual output y3 multiplied by uh, the partial derivative of y3 with respect to the weight matrix y? So what happens here is is that we're actually calculating um, the gradient, um, our, our gradient update needed for 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 the uh, weight matrix y uh, by just, and we only go back to our first state or go back to our, or whatever state we're on. So no time yet. Because, as you know, each output is only related to whatever state you output it is. It's not, I mean, technically it is related to the previous states, but in the actual math, in the actual math it, only, um, it only works out to where the, the current state is. Yeah. So yeah. what is the E state? E is error. error. Yeah. Okay. So that's our error, whatever error function we have. So it could be cross entropy or um, uh, mean squared error, things like that. So, yep. any other questions before we go on? It's about to get real interesting real fast. Now let's update our state matrix. <laughs> so, you know, don't, don't let this freak you out because it really is just the same thing, but we're just adding <coughs> on an extra term each time with every time step that we go back through. So as you can see here, we're going to update our weight matrix for the state. So as we do that, we're going to start at... Um, we're going to start at our y, so we're going to go from the error to y, and that's going to calculate the, uh, the, the, um, that gradient, multiplied by the gradient of y3 to s3, so we're actually going back to our, our state, s3, and calculating the, uh, the gradient for that, and multiplied by the state to the weight matrix s. So that, this first part here, this first portion here, put over here, and here as well, this, the, um, that's going to be our pretty much our gradient update for state three itself. But as you know, state three is dependent on state two, dependent on state one. So that's what these next two terms are. So as you can see here, each time we go through, so now we're going from, now we're going from the same thing, we're going from the error to y3, y3 to state three, but now we gotta get to state two. So we're gonna take the, the gradient from state three to state two. And once we do that, and then once, once we're and at that current state, we need to go to the state two, the weight matrix of the state, uh, so WS. Everybody following? Good? No, you, you no I, I get it. I just, I don't know. It's just the, the way that you use that chain rule is just weird. Oh. That's what it is in essence, but. <laughs> uh, well, it's not really a chain rule, but it's a, what we're more, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess you can see it as a chain rule. Um, but what it's going on is that, you know, you're pretty much kind of, you need to go back. So that's what really is happening is the process of going back to back through time. Right. And so state three to state two is basically the, the, you know, whatever the state three, like, function was and state two function, with regards to state two, calculating, like, how different they are, like, how much they change in that gradient. So that's what's going on. And then once you get to state two, you got to go from state two to the weight matrix. And then now for state one, it's the same thing, but now we're going from state two to state one, and then state one with regards to the weight matrix. But remember that the weight matrix isn't changing at each time step. This is to update the way overall weight matrix for this uh, uh, cell. And remember, this is only one cell, by the way. Like this isn't multiple cells or multiple layers. This is just a single cell. All right, everyone following? Any questions? No? All right. So now our, our last weight matrix we need to update is the weight, is the weights for the uh, uh, matrix for the input. 
And now this is um, pretty much a similar process. Instead of going to the state, we now take the weight. We now go from the state to the weight matrix S instead X. Instead of going from the state to weight matrix S, which is the weight matrix for the state. So we go from error three, or error three, uh, error sub three, which is going to be your, at time step three, to Y three. We're going from Y three. Going from I three to state three, three. and stay over here, and then we're going from state um, state three to the weight matrix X. So we're kind of going down a straight line there. Once we go down that, then we kind of need to come back and then go over one, come down, and then go over one and come down, and then that's um, that's updating on each previous input, and um, and once we and then we sum all of those, and that gives us our overall gradient needed to update the weight matrix. So yeah, so that's back propagation time. Really fun. So I'm sure some of you probably are thinking there's probably something interesting gonna happen here. So what happens, so this was only three time steps. What happens when we get to really large time steps? Like 500,000 time steps, mm -hmm. a thousand, or, or a million. It takes longer to do the calculations. Yeah, so those calculations will definitely be very large because you know, we have to go back through a million time steps. What also do you think might happen? So, would vanishing gradient be involved? Vanishing gradient, that's a really good point, and we'll talk about that, yeah. So vanishing gradient meaning, because we're look at all the multiplications we're doing here. You know, most, pretty much these numbers are going to be between 0 and 1. So what happens when we multiply a number by a num another number between 0 and 1? It's smaller. Gets smaller. So it keeps doing that over and over again. Your gradient update may just become 0, because you're multiplying it over so, so many times. Any other thoughts? Yeah, that was pretty much, that was, those are the two like main things that are going on. Very computationally expensive and you know, you have your advantage of grading it problem. So, and it's actually the time step, depending on what model you have, you know, your, the time step for actually starting countering this is actually really small. So before it starts like really going out of control. So there's also the exploding gradient problem, which is the reverse of the vanishing gradient. Because if you actually have gradients that are somehow bigger than one, which you know, can happen depending on what you're trying to predict, you know, you keep multiplying them together, you can get a huge gradient that this, you know, model can't learn from that. Um, so, you're going to have those two problems. So, since we have those two problems, what, so I talked about, does anybody remember the, the first uh, model that I mentioned right at the beginning besides RNNs that we're going to cover? A&N? No, not a &N. The, the I would say we're a couple RNNs and what? Starts with an L. LSTM. So that's where LSTMs are actually to the rescue here. So what LSTMs actually solve this, um, this vanishing gradient problem. And they do it in a very interesting way. So the, this, the LSTM actually has um, uh, a way to be able to recall information across many time steps uh, uh, efficiently and, and without causing vanishing gradient or things like that. So in order, and the way it does that is its incorporation of long-term memory. So that's what the um, long short-term memory. So that's long memory and short-term memory, and incorporating it into the model. So it's able to kind of solve this problem of like um, going back many time steps and you know and having a vanishing gradient or whatever. So if LSTMs are seen um, as having long-term memory, then what can short, uh, simple RNNs seen be seen as having? Yeah. I feel like it also it is also long to remember because everything's based on the previous thing. But then again, if you only remember the if you're only looking at the last state, that's technically short term. Short term. So yeah, so if so <coughs> if if we have long term memory, technically simple RNNs do have long term memory, but any any time any um you know, anything past like a certain time step it pretty much forgets because it just gets zeroed out by getting multiplied by so many times. So really, simple RNNs kind of just have this short-term memory where they can only remember so far before it becomes pretty much, you know, you know, impossible to actually calculate any further, to make any more information to previous time steps. Yeah. Can you give an example for um, an application why, where LSTMs are better than simple RNNs? Pretty much every application. <laughs> I mean, simple RNNs on their, at their basic, they can solve simple problems, but you know, most most recurrent neural networks to these days are actually pretty much LSTMs or GRUs, so not from Despicable Me, um, GRUs. They're, um, 
those are really popular as well, and I'll talk a little bit at the end about those. Um, there's also quite a few different variations of these and things like that, but really, um, since the SIP RNN has those have these like really like huge issues. Um, they're good for teaching and stuff like that and leading into other models, but really in these days it's LSTMs and variations and that, that you'll see in research and other things for, for pretty much every domain. Any other questions? Nope. All right. So let's learn, a little, let's learn about LSTMs here. So LSTMs utilize what's called um, cells, so different cells. In, so one, one recurrent network cell actually has little baby cells inside of it. Um, and there's four of them. And each of these cells perform different functions. So in these cells, we're going to call them gates. Um, these gates control the flow of information. So it kind of a gate controls the flow of people. These gates will control whether information gets passed through or dropped. Um, so in each cell, it's going to consider short-term and long-term memory and the current inputs. It's going to consider three things before making its output, uh, which makes it really powerful. So let's look at a, just a diagram of how these interactions work. So our four cells are going to be our forget or gates are going to be for forget gate, learn gate, remember gate, and uh, use gate. So you can kind of intuit what these gates are going to be doing. So forget gate will determine what to forget. You know, use gate is going to determine what we want to use right now. Learn gate is going to determine what we want to learn, and remember gate is going to determine what we want to remember for the long term. And it also outputs our updated long term memory and our updated short term memory, which is also the output for the current time step. Any questions on this? We're going to break this down a little bit more and go into detail. But do you understand these interactions? And we're also going to call our input the event. It, they're just the same thing, but yeah. What's the difference between uh, learn and remember? Uh, we're going to learn more about that. <laughs> but uh, learn is going to determine what we learn, right? What we, what we want to learn from the current information, like the input. Mm -hmm. And remember is going to determine like what we want to remember in the long term. So like short term versus long term. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So, is it are, are each of these are are each of these big cells, not the four little ones, similar to the states from the simple? Arm? Yeah. So each one's kind of will have their own weight matrices and their own states. Uh, there's an, like an overall state to the cell, and then you know, but the overall state of the cell is just based on all the states of the imp of the cells inside. And then but they're chained together like they were. Yeah, well, these, they're, they're, they're connected together by these uh, arrows here. So the forget leads into remember and use. Learn leads into remember and use. And then use this leads to the updated SCM. And remember leads to the updated LTM. That's your question? So how does something, like if something is determined not to be forgotten, like how is it, what's like the trend relationship between forget and use? Um, well, forget will determine what to forget, not what not to forget. Okay. So it's kind of the other way. So it basically it'll just remove information it think it deems it doesn't need anymore and then pass that along to the uh, remember and use gate. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. What's called a cell again? Just All right, so, forget so this use. whole thing, so technically both of these are cells, but I'm gonna call them gates. Gates, they, they make more sense to be called as gates because they control the flow of information. Overall, this is one LSTM cell. This is one LSTM. Each LSTM cell has four gates inside and each gate actually has its own um, uh, hidden layer and weight matrix contributed to that. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions? <coughs> oh, excuse me. All right. Well, let's break this down even further. So we're going to actually see these, uh, how these uh, interact to each other. So what's this little, uh, this little sigma here stand for? Sigmoid. Sigmoid, yes. So we're going to have sigmoid. We're also going to have tan H activation, so that's a hyperbolic tangent. Um, does anyone remember what value hyperbolic tangent, uh, the range of values it gives the uh, outputs? Quick one. Yeah. Oh. Is it negative one to one? Yes. Yes, so negative one to one. This, uh, I think that was covered in neural networks, but yeah. So that's just another activation function where we can get activation from negative one to one. Um, these x's are not dot products, they're element wise multiplication. Does everyone understand what element wise means? between two matrices. Does anybody not understand? Raise your hand. All right, so, the, um, so element Y, so you, do you know what a dot product is? No. All right, so when you have two matrices, and that, um, when, you, when I say element-wise, um, you know, for a matrix, you multiply each value element-wise. So if 
the element in like element at zero zero here and the element at zero zero here gets multiplied together and put into a new matrix, and that's element life. Um, dot product. Um, Maybe I can talk to you after about like what the actual dot product operation is. Is you're pretty much multiplying a row and like sum and summing all those multiplications together um, uh, for a matrix. But we'll cover it more after. So if you want to learn more, um, but yeah. So that's that's what's going on here. Um, and this uh, these brackets here mean concatenation. So concatenation means you take one matrix and then just literally put another matrix as attach it on and then it becomes one whole new matrix. So that's what concatenation is. And so that's what these brackets mean right here. All right. So this is a lot of interactions here. So we're going to break down each gate individually and then we're going to come back to this and then see, you know, so we can get, uh, see how, how really this all works together here. Also the plus sign is addition. So I will know why it's addition. All right. So let's get started. So let's start with the forget gate. So the forget gate is going to choose what to forget. So and it's going to choose what to forget based on. <coughs> oh, excuse me. It's going to be um, based on the previous short term and long term memory, and also the um, current input. So that's what ET is. So remember, E is our event. Um, e is our event. We have our previous short term memory, which is at t minus one. We have um, LTM of t minus one, you know, um, and that's all going to come together. So how does that actually come together? Let's see. Um, we have our LTM come in. Uh, we have our event and short-term memory come in here. Um, there's this f of t here, so that's called a forget factor. So our forget factor. Let's see how that's calculated. So it's a sigmoid of the uh, weight matrix for this uh, uh, gate. So WF. Um, Multiplied by the concatenation of the short-term memory, a previous short-term memory, and the uh, and the current event, and plus some bias. So again, some bias is like just a constant that's added, and that's also another learnable parameter, like a weight. Um, it learns what this bias is. That's all passed through the sigmoid. So what value are we going to get here? Like what range? <laughs> yeah. So we're going to get some type of value between zero and one. So you can think of it kind of like a factor, like a percent of what to forget from our data. So that's what's outputted here. Then that's multiplied by the long-term memory, and then we get an updated um, long-term memory. Remember, this isn't our final long-term memory. This is just going to be an update, because remember, we if you remember, we have the remember gate. So that's going to be coming up soon. So that's good. It's going to output our updated um, long-term memory. Any questions? Yeah? So I guess the forget factor is sort of like you choose what to like degrade over time, I guess? Well, it chooses like it just it chooses um, based on like every um, all the information we have currently. It's like okay, all this information I have, there's like twenty percent that I want to forget from it, and that's kind of like what's going on. What that information means again, because we don't know the computer knows what it's doing, <coughs> what what these, but we can't actually open up and say this value. It's forgetting exactly this piece of information because we just don't know. It's kind of a black box there. Yeah. Uh, what is the BF inside the sigmoid? Uh, that's going to be a bias. So okay. it's just a learnable parameter, like a weight. Yeah. Okay. So if you remember from neural networks, our, our, general <coughs> our general activation is the weight matrix times the input plus some bias pass through our activation. So that's pretty much what's going on here. So you can imagine this as just like a, a hidden layer inside, inside of our, um, our LSTM cell, one of our hidden layers. Any other questions? Oh. All right, so next gate on the <coughs> list. Let's see what we have. Learn gate. So the learn gate is going to choose what to learn from our short-term memory and our event. Um, so, and what it's going to do is similar to the forget factor. It's going to take these two and, and it's going to. This is new information. Remember, our event is our new information. It's going to be like, okay, so I know this new information. Um, I have my previous short-term memory. Now it's like, okay, what do I want to learn from this new information, and what do I want to ignore? Um, because obviously, every time you get new information, you know. It's not, all, not all of it is always meaningful. There could be some noise and some other things. So um, what's happened here, you calculate your ignore factor. So this ignore factor is, free, is calculated the same exact way as our forget factor, except we have another weight matrix, weight matrix of i. So it's going to be a separate uh, hidden, hidden layer in this. Um, so first, uh, we have a torture memory and our event pass through uh, CanH activation. Um, 
And we also have the event and the short-term memory passed in to a sigmoid to get our ignore factor. So again, it's a, a somewhere from between zero from one that's gonna determine how much information we wanna ignore from this new information. Um, this NFT, um, N doesn't really mean anything, it's just a variable name, so you can see it at the end here. So this is, uh, this is, um, is our activation that's going on here. So this TANH cell is doing TANH. Um, so we also have a separate weight. So this actually has two weight matrices in here. So we have W, I, and W, uh, N. So there's two uh, like hidden layers kind of in here, two weight matrices. And again, we're using the same type of uh, you know, linear combination where we're taking the weights, dot product with the concatenation of short-term memory, previous short-term memory, and the event, plus some bias. Once we get to the, once we calculate our north factor, we need to then, so from this information, N and T, that our new information, um, we're going to then, we're going to choose, um, we're going to ignore some of that uh, information from it. Cause, so we're going to element wise multiply our ignore factor. And this outputs our updated STM, but not our final one. So we got two more gates. Everyone following me so far? So as you can see here, it's really, these gates are, you know, applying the same principle we learned before, these linear combinations, passing in through some activation, but we're doing it in a certain way to be able to sim simulate like short-term memory and long-term memory and things like that. Any questions? All right. So here's, here's gonna be your favorite gate. Remember gates, very easy. We just add, so we have our updated information from the, sh uh, uh, from the, forget, uh, from the forget gate, our updated LTM. We have our updated short-term memory from the uh, learn gate. We just add them together, element-wise adding them together. And then that's going to be our final new long-term memory output for this cell. Yep, and that's it. Very simple. All right, and then that leaves our last gate. So now we got our long-term memory. Well, um, we now need to output a, our new short-term memory. And that's where the use gate's going to come in. So the use gate here <coughs> is going to take, is actually going to use that new long-term memory. So now we got our new long-term memory. We're going to use that in order to um, see what we want to use at this current time step and also update our short-term memory with that because they're the same, they're the same output here. Um, so we're going to take our new LTM. We're going to... We're going to perform um, a sigmoid operation from, we're actually going to use our previous LTM in our event here. Um, pass that through to sigmoid in the same way. We're going to linearly uh, do a linear combination of them. Um, pass it through sigmoid. I'll, I'll do a, um, and it, you can imagine V of T kind of like what, are, what we want to use. Like this is kind of the percent we want to use now because it's the same way. It was like the forget factor and the ignore factor and things like that. Um, and it has its own weight matrix here. So, and then we element-wise multiply, and then um, so we just pass through our LTM through a tan H, um, and then once we get to that, we have our short-term memory, and our short-term memory is also the output for this cell. So. Ooh, that's it. So that is that is our. Let me go back here. So that is all of these interactions and what's going on here. So you can, if you want to, so let's take a second and let this sink in, and now. You could kind of see like where all these operations are coming through. Any questions? Let me take a minute. Yeah. So, um, the short-term memory, the final output. Mm -hmm. uh, what's it being used again? Is just being used uh, for the new output for, for Y? Is that yeah. So short-term memory, you can make output, so it could be our Y too. Okay. So our short-term memory is going to be our output for the cell, and also our new short-term memory. It's the same thing. Any questions? Any other questions? <coughs> All right. So we're gonna. So that's that's LSTMs. Um, we're gonna cover one more topic today related to um, recurrent neural networks um, that you'll see pretty much everywhere, and then we'll get into our workshop. So, and that's gonna be embedding layers. So. Embedding layers, so we have this, um, especially like with text generation, you know, can we just take a word, like a string, and just input it to the neural networks, like here, take this string, do something with it. Do you think we can do that? Do you? I see some, maybe some head shakes. No? Yeah, probably not. I mean, because I mean, again, I mean, a string is just a representation of numbers, but we can't just feed like a raw string and be like, yeah, do something with the string, you know? 
Um, there needs to be a there needs to be a you know a good way where we can represent um, where we can represent um, like strings or other pieces of data that aren't exactly numbers as numbers. Um, so what the embedding layer is, it creates a way to do this. Um, so if you have a huge number of classes, so say you know. Um, and you know the example we're going to be using is text, since that's going to be our workshop. You know, English dictionaries like how, how many words? Like I don't know, like sixty thousand, fifty thousand, something like that. Um, more if you're using other languages, or if you want to use multiple languages, or if you want to use words not in the dictionary, like depending on your context, it could be a lot of words. And trying to represent. So imagine having to like. Uh, does anybody? Does everybody know what one hot encoding is? Or no? Okay, so like one hot encoding is like having, um, so instead of having like a class like represented by like a single integer, like class 15, it's instead represented by a, uh, a vector of zeros with one, with the, with a number one in the uh, f uh, 15th place to kind of remember, to, to signify that. So, you know, so that's like a vector of zeros and ones. So imagine you have 100,000 classes, your output is going to be 999,999 you know, zeros and one one. You know, that's like that's pretty inefficient because when you're doing dot products and back propagation, you know that's you know you're doing a lot of just multiplying by zero. So this embedding layer will help create you know a way to represent your classes you know very um, in a in a much lower in a lower dimension, but also be able to retain all the information. So. All right. So let's look at how this actually works and what actually comes from embedding layers. So. Um, so, let's see, we have the, um, so again, we're going to be using the example of uh, using words, because uh, that's a very popular um, domain for uh, using these embedding layers. Um, so, and what we're going to be doing today. So, a cool thing what you can do about this, since each, so the, this embedding, um, what this embedding does, it's going to output a, uh, a vector of a bunch of numbers, so depending on the size of the embedding layer. So this, so what I mean by a bunch of numbers, this is going to be a vector of numbers that represent whatever class is, in this case, whatever represent the word. Uh, we don't know, each number individually has no meaning, but to the computer, you know, the way um, it has, um, you know, me contains all the information about the word. And what, what comes from this is being able to create sem uh, semantic relationships between words. So what, it, what an embedding layer is able to do is be able to correlate words that are are close to each other, or words that are similar. So in this case, like um, we have a king. Um, so a king would be, uh, you know, correlated to. Um, so a king, like in a man, they're both blue. They're correlated together, but they also correlate to uh, different ideas. So like a king, you know, usually if you have a king, you have a queen. So those both are correlated together as well. A man and a woman that could be correlated because they're you know both human, you know, different for different meanings. Um, so there's verb tense too, it's like swimming to swam. So you know the embedding layer will be able to contain information that swam is the past tense of swim, and swimming is the you know present tense or the verb. Um, so and then here's some you know some other like capitals and uh, countries of capitals. Um, yeah, so that's really cool. So that and that's really good information our network uh, can utilize. Because if they can realize semantic relations between words, they can build more, you know, they can build better output because it knows like what, what um, how to structure um, its sentences and whatever it outputs in such a way that it, um, it can relate those words together. Pretty cool stuff. Any questions? Yeah. So is this another neural network that does this thing? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically a hidden layer. It's one layer. It's a type of layer. It's not like a, a network in itself, but... Is it pre-trained? Both. You can, um, and we'll talk about this in a second. Um, but yeah, you can pre-train it and transfer it to other models, or you can also train it with your model. And I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, any other questions? And you, you know, you kind of hit my right, right on the next point here. So you can actually, you know, create um, entire, you know, um, uh, I guess you can tra create models to actually train just a single embedding layer. Once you treat, you could train as embedding layer, so it knows the correlate or the semantic relation between every word in the dictionary, and then you could transfer that to other models. So that model already starts with a ton of like really valuable information about how words are related to other and stuff. It can train a lot faster, um, and 
reach a lot lower loss. Um, so in order to do this, um, we need to, so the embedding layer is also always the input to your model. So it's your first layer. Um, and what it does is first, you know, again, we talked about how we can't just slap a string into it and hope for the best. Uh, we need to represent these uh, words somehow. So we do what's called tokenizing them. Tokenizing all that does is we take a word and we represent it by some integer value, as you can see here. Now it also includes um, that also includes punctuation. So like heart is represented by 957, uh, period is rep like represented by 675, and that just depends on the vocabulary. But that's what's called by tokenizing. Then you input this huge, this you know, this integer into the embedding layer, and the embedding layer will output that vector of numbers to represent. Um, so at the end of this um, of this uh, of these slides, there's some resources to talk about different models that are specific to training um, submit the training embedding layers to detect the semantic relationship between um, words. And those are some popular models for Skipgram and CBAL, continuous bag of words. So you can, I highly encourage you to check them out at the end. Um, they're really cool, and they're really powerful. Um, but in our case, like during a workshop, we're just going to train it with the, with the network, and it'll, it'll learn those, uh, what, those relationships uh, on the fly as it's training. All right. Well, I have a few more notes on just on RNNs in general, but that's that's it. So embedding layers help for you know most pretty much any recurrent uh, model, or doesn't even have to be recurrent neural networks, but they're more popularly used with those. But they can be like any type of model. They can just help represent your data in a better way, uh, easier way for your model to actually learn from. So I have some a few notes on hyperparameters and we'll talk about GRU as well. Check my time here. Okay. So, GRU is called a gated recurrent network, or gated, no, no, gated recurrent unit, I think it's called. Uh, I forgot the U part. But, um, but pretty much it's like a LSTM. It's like a, it's like a diet LSTM. There's only two gates in it. Um, and I think it's the, uh, I think it's the uh, forget gate and the use gate. <coughs> um, but, <coughs> but it does it in such a way. So it's a lighter model, and it can actually perform similarly to an LSTM but it's also a lot less hyperparameters because it's only just two gates instead of four in there. Um, so sometimes GRU can work better if you have like a, like a data set that it overfits really like highly on and stuff, like a small data set and you're overfitting with LSTM at GRU since it has less hyperparameters, can overfit less. Um, I, there's also, the, um, so here, um, I have the resources here, so I have some stuff on GRU and the three and stuff, so I would suggest you read them. Um, so yeah, so depending, so usually it's the, the thing is to try both and see if one works better than the other. Um, and it's a simple change, because GRU pretty much works exactly the same as LSTM, so just, you know, work differently, like, uh, like code-wise, but they work differently on the other. Um, so for LSTM, so you can probably think that having like multiple hidden layers in a single cell, you know, just with a few LSTM layers, we can reach really high parameter counts and get really large networks just from a few layers of LSTM. Actually, for most, most applications, two to three like LSTM layers is really all you need because beyond that, you have so many parameters that you'll just overfit or not train. Um, the only um, interesting note that speech recognition from what some research papers and stuff has shown, you actually use a really large and deep network to be able to actually get good results with that. So that's, so you know, just to show that not everything, you know, everything has an exception when it comes to neural networks, but so that's pretty interesting. But. Yeah, usually your LSTM work, uh, um, networks are small um, in size and uh, for the amount of cells and the amount of layers is because they have so many parameters. It's hard to actually make big models and fit them into memory and stuff. And then embedding size, it's like, depends. Like if you have like a really huge um, amount of classes, you might want a larger embedding size to be able to represent it properly, you know, maybe smaller. So that's kind of something that's like, there really isn't like a, a ground, like, like a good value to start out with, but I, I put for, for most of the stuff when I was looking online of other people done, anywhere from like 250 to 600 was kind of like what people used, but that's just kind of empirical and yeah, take that with a grain of salt. You know, that's just something you just have to do. But yeah, so any questions on anything I covered? No? Um, feedback form.
So we have a feedback form. You can go to this link. Um, you don't have to do it. If you want to stay for the workshop, you can do it after the workshop. But this is really important to give us feedback on you know, um, what I'm going to be doing, what I just uh, covered now, and also what uh, Dylan's going to be covering the uh, workshop. Um, you know, just like how well we did and where we can improve, not only for us presenting, but also for the content itself. And that really helps us in the future uh, semesters to refine our content. So yeah. All right. So we're going to transition in a workshop here. I'll show you how to open up our workshop on Kaggle, <coughs> and then uh, Dylan will take it away with that. So thank you. All right. Um, so let's do this. All right. Yeah, so you can get set up in your laptop. Now. Um, also, if you um, if you uh, need to leave for the workshop part, that's fine too. You can go ahead and fill out the feedback form. And if you don't want to stay for the workshop, you know, it's perfectly fine. Uh, did you so. say I was going to be doing a workshop on this computer? Yeah, you you need to pull it up on there to like get like to have your stuff up. But yeah, you'll be doing it on here. Um, yeah. All right. So let's pull up. Uh, I'm over here. Oh, this is so. Okay. So I'll show you guys how to pull it up, um, and then we'll get started here. All right. So for uh, anyone interested in following along with the code, um, if you just please follow Brandon, he's going to walk you through the steps of how we yeah. uh, to get to our notebook for the code. So All right, so um, let's start. Let's go to ucfa.org. Uh, go to our website, and we'll go from here to open it up. Um, so first, you're going to go to uh, core, um, and then our spring 2020 edition, the semester we're in. And then uh, we're going to scroll down to our workshop for today, which is RNNs here, and just click follow along with Kaggle. And I'll go to the workshop for today. Um, so you'll need to sign in. If you have, don't have a Kaggle account, you can create a Kaggle account in your Google account. Um, so, and, if, and since we're using a DPU today, it requires <laughs> you to verify with your phone number. So that's just because they don't want people trying to use up all their DPUs, I guess. So that's something you'll need to do. Um, and which I'm going to sign in right now. Everybody was able to pull that up and go over it again. All right. Um, let's, let's see. You should just be able to sign in with your Google account. Yep. Uh, let's say reset me. Okay. All right. You need, need anything? You good to go? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, it actually pulled the data. <laughs> I tested it. It does. <laughs> we're good, we're good. Okay, so. And then once you and once you get to the notebook, you'll see a copy and edit, and then it'll ask you to accept the terms for using the data. So just click I understand and accept, and then it will uh, pull up your notebook for you. Let me f we'll screen this. Let this go away. Um, all right. I, it's kind of so it's a little bit annoying how we, we do. Fine. Yeah, you have this here. So this, uh, I mean, you can. I mean, it's pretty. It's not really that hard to see, but you might just have to eyeball it a bit. But yeah. Um, everybody can read that, okay? Yes. Yep. Okay. All righty. Good luck. <laughs> um, I love that. And my stuff. All right, so just to get a feel for the room, uh, I'd like to see a show of hands of just hands all the way up if you're pretty comfortable with Python, hands halfway up if you're sort of comfortable with Python, and no hands if you don't really have any experience with it. Okay, so good range between everybody. All right. So, uh, and also who is going to be following along on their own devices? All right, awesome. So uh, if you are following along on our Kaggle notebook, uh, then you're just going to have to run this cell up at the top just to get things going with Kaggle. Um, to run a cell, if you're not familiar with any Jupyter notebooks, it, it's going to be Shift-Enter. That's a pro move. 
So we're going to run that guy right there. All right. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about the imports that we're going to be using for this. So uh, for those who are not very familiar with Python, we have something called NumPy. And NumPy just basically gives us um, access to some multi-dimensional arrays. Arrays are always nice to use. And uh, we'll be using those uh, to convert to tensors and to store some data later. Uh, we're also going to be importing time. And time is going to help us for when we're training, we can look at how long our model is taking to train uh, and use that for when we're saving some files. We're going to use OS just uh, for some path environment stuff. Uh, and then glob is just for some naming conventions. Uh, and then our framework that we're going to be using for this notebook is going to be PyTorch. Uh, PyTorch is made by Facebook, and it's a pretty powerful um, machine learning uh, framework as opposed to something like uh, TensorFlow. TensorFlow is also very powerful, but um, it's getting a little bit dated now. Uh, if you're interested in using TensorBoard, which is um, a way to visualize your network and visualize your models and stuff, then you can uncomment uh, TensorBoard X there. Uh, you would just need to pip install it. Um, we're not going to be using that today, but that is something that is an option. If you're looking at some of the other imports, you can see we have stuff like uh, .nn for our neural networks, functional for things like our activation functions. We have our optimizer. Uh, CUDNN is what we're going to be using. Um, it's from NVIDIA, and it's going to basically just be when we're sending our data to the GPU, NVIDIA has a little bit of uh, optimizing magic that they add in. Uh, and then tensor data set and data loader are just going to be so that we can work with tensors and so that we can um, load up data. And don't forget to run it, because that'd be bad. All right, um, so I'm just going to go over some functions that we're going to be defining here. So we have uh, load script, which is pretty straightforward. It's going to be taking our text file of Moe's Tavern, which is going to be our episode of The Simpsons, and it's going to just be loading it in um, into our, loading it up for us into a variable, uh, and we're going to hold on to that. And then we were, as we were going over tokenizing earlier uh, in the lecture, um, this is going to be our dictionary that's going to hold the uh, keys and values for our tokens. So you'll see on the left hand side all of the punctuations and then on the right hand side we have all of the things that we'll be converting them into first before tokenizing them. Uh, you'll notice that they're wrapped with double bars and this is just because uh, let's say that we run into the word comma um, in our actual text. We don't want the word comma to be mistaken with the punctuation comma so we wrap it with double bars so that when it gets tokenized it is a separate value. Going down a little bit, uh, you can just see that we have some functions for actually tokenizing those punctuations and untokenizing those punctuations. Uh, and that's just going to help us facilitate what I just said of just turning those into the double bar versions. And then later, we'll use those to uh, turn into integers. And then we have this nice function here called generate sequence, uh, which is going to be taking in our text and running through it. Uh, and it's going to, later on, we're going to find out um, the average number of words in the sentences that they are speaking in the script. And then we're going to take that and use it as our sequence. And uh, you'll see later on that that's going to be about 12 words. And then the last word in that sequence we're going to want to have as our target. And that target is basically something that once we give the sequence, we want to have the model predict that target. So right here at the bottom, you'll see that that sequence is going to be stored in a NumPy array. And then that target is also going to be stored in an NumPy array. And the indices of the two will match up. Now we've got this big function here that you can read into a little bit later if you're really <coughs> curious. But basically, this is just going to be um, printing some statistics about our model as it's training uh, in a very nice format. So we have um, import tabulate just for some formatting purposes. Uh, we'll get things like our precision, our loss, our accuracy. Uh, and these are just nice values to keep track of as the model is training so that you can see how it's performing. And now we want to actually, oh, you know, I should probably run those. Don't forget to run your cells, because later ones won't work. Uh, now we want to actually look at some statistics about our data set, uh, which is that episode Moe's Tavern. 
So you can see here uh, the approximate number of words that we have in this data set is 11,100. Uh, and this is accounting separately for words that are uppercase, words that are lowercase, words that have punctuations on them or not, even if they're the same word. Uh, so this number is going to reduce in size a little bit once we start working with our data a little bit more. Um, the number of scene changes we have in this episode is about uh, 262, um, and that's just you know scene change, environment change in the episode. And then the average number of sentences in those scenes is 15. The average number of lines in the entire text uh, is about 4,000. And then the number we really care about here is the average number of words per line. So this is relating back to that sequence that I was talking about earlier. Uh, we're going to use this number 12 as our sequence length. And then the 13th word will be that target that we're going to want to predict. Does anybody have any questions about this data set and how we're going to start going about this or any functions that I've defined so far? Your input to the network, which we'll see later, is constant. That's why we have this sequence length. Because you can't input, um, you can't, and different um, things called like uh, encoder decoder models can input like variable length uh, input, but in our case, we can't do that. So that's why we have this sequence length in the in in standard input. So, yeah. I mean, and there's some more, he'll go into later about um, different sequence lengths. Yeah, so it is always nice to uh, look at the statistics of your data set because you want to just see what you're working with, see if, uh, if by chance there's any outliers in your data set that you want to remove first, or if there's some kind of abnormality that you didn't catch. All right, and then this is just some information about tokenizing and uh, what we're doing if you're interested in reading into that. So. Oh yeah. Um, one thing to note of this text is that when we are tokenizing, we are going to be starting with the integer 1, uh, and that's because we reserve the integer 0 for padding. Um, and you'll see later we're going to be using some padding functions and when that comes in, but it is important to note uh, that 0 is important for padding, and that's why we reserve it. So uh, that function that we had defined earlier for tokenizing the punctuations, we're going to call that now and pass in our um, script. And then we're going to take that and we're going to turn it on to lowercase just so we have um, an easier data set to work with. Um, this is just kind of common practice because when you're dealing with uh, uppercase and lowercase, it's kind of harder to make certain semantic relationships. Uh, and then we're just going to split all that up so that it is a list of all of those words individually. And we're also just going to take a look at 20 of those just to see what we have. So you can see here, um, it is Moe's Tavern, so we have Mo in there. We've got some of those punctuations. Uh, Mo may be on the phone. It is Moe's Tavern, so Moe's Tavern shows up in there. We've got Bart Simpson. He is a character in the episode, so that makes sense. So here we get... Uh, into some data pre-processing. Um, like where I was saying earlier, we have the sequence length of 12, and we define that uh, because that was the average length of our sentences. So that's just going to be a good number to work with. Uh, we also have a batch size of 64. So who's familiar with batch size? We've got some. OK. So uh, batch size is useful because we don't want to feed a bunch of data to the GPU individually because that can take a long time. Uh, by clustering it into batches, it helps better optimize it, and it helps training go a lot faster. So this can kind of be analogous to uh, if you're walking through a forest and your only way to get through that forest is with a compass, you can either A, take a step, look at the compass, take a step, look at the compass, take a step, or you can take like 10 or 20 steps and then you can look at the compass, take another 10 or 20 steps and then look at the compass again. You can see where the advantage might be there. 
So now we've got some things like taking our words. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the enumerate function, basically it's just going to add an indice to all of these words. And we're going to store this in a dictionary. And then we also have a dictionary here where we're just taking the previous dictionary and flipping it. And then we're going to be converting all of our text into integers and saving it. So the int script text, the integer version. Uh, and then we're going to just store that in the NumPy array uh, because we like the NumPy arrays. Uh, and then we're going to be calling that generate sequence that I had talked about earlier. So this is going to take that text and it's going to give us an output of our sequences and of our targets. And we're going to store those uh, in two NumPy arrays that I had shown earlier. So you can see here it's going to be taking that, storing our sequences here in int text, and then our targets here. And like I said, those indices are going to be matching up. Then. Um, pretty straightforward. We have our vocabulary size. And you'll notice this is going to go down a bit from the 11,000 that we had earlier uh, because we did lowering and um, uh, tokenizing and stuff like that. And then we have uh, this tensor data set, which is basically just we're going to take that um, NumPy array, the sequence, and we're going to take the NumPy array of the targets, and we're going to group them together. Uh, we also have a data loader, which is basically going to be getting our data ready for us um, in the background so that it's not taking so long to process. And you can see here our vocabulary size did go down quite a bit. So we're at about um, 6,600 now. And this data loader has uh, 1.1 thousand batch clusters in it. All right, so now we're going to be actually getting into building the model. So first, we're just going to want to initialize some of the things that we have in this model. So like we were talking about the embedding layer earlier, uh, the embedding layer is going to be getting trained along with our LSTM. We're not going to uh, train it, pre-train it beforehand and transfer it in. And then we're going to define our hidden dimensions, how many that we want, um, the vocabulary size that we have after stripping and tokenizing things, uh, and the number of layers that we're going to have in this LSTM. And then, let's see, we're going to define our LSTM here. So I want everybody to walk through this with me and give me some suggestions. Did you read the text block about can I explain yeah. some of <laughs> so we're going to want to name this uh, self.lstm, so that's going to be a good place to start. Uh, and as a hint, we do have this block of text above, and this is going to be giving you some ideas of how we should start defining this LSTM. So first off, what should we name it? Self.lstm. There we go. Self Right, and from there, who wants to spitball some ideas? So, what is an LSTM? A kind of a broad network. question, but it's a, uh, a neural network. Is a neural network, and what can we abbreviate that as? NN. NN. LSTM. Nice. <laughs> All right, and if you take a look at the block above, uh, you can see some of the parameters that we have. So what should we start with? Input size. Input size. And what do you think that's going to equal? 12. Plus 2, so, or self dot hidden underscore dimension. So we uh, are actually going to use our embedding size, and we have that defined already. So we're going to use. So remember, your embedding is your first layer, and then that goes into your LSTM. So the output, the output of the embedding is going to be the subsize embedding size. So that's what's going to be the input size to the LSTM. Any ideas for the next parameter? Hidden size. Hidden size. Yes. That is correct. And what do you think we're going to put for there? Not quite. Look You're over, close. Look at the 
what we're passing to the constructor there. Yeah. LSTM size. There we go. LSTM size. All right, so we've got a few more parameters. Anyone want to take another shot? Num layers. Num layers? Yeah. Someone's looking at the notebook. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. Yeah, remember in PyTorch, and in an LSTM, I should create a full you know, multi layered network. Mm. And then we just set that equal to num layers. There we go. So, pretty straightforward for that one. Num layers is just going to be num layers that we have. Sorry, I'm working on a small screen here. <laughs> All right, we got a few more. Drop out. Yep, drop out is correct. And let's see if we can get someone else to guess for that one. The drop out from the. Uh, Indeed, it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We are almost there. What do you think this last one is? Batch first equals true. <laughs> wow! <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. And we're going to get rid of that guy. And make sure you delete the raise not implement there, otherwise, it'll raise an error. Mm, we don't want errors. <laughs> All right, so you guys just walked me through that LSTM, lovely. Now I want you to walk me through the classifier. All right, let's start with a name. What do you think our classifier name should be? Hint, hint. Indeed it is. Whoop, self. All right, and what can you think of a classifier as? A generic network. Yeah, so what do you think we should start it with? And then dot. And then dot. There's no way it's not classifier. Mm, not quite. <laughs> well, what, are, what are fully connected layers called in PyTorch? Oh, linear. Linear indeed. All right. Let's work with some parameters. What do you think we're passing in there? What's the size? What's the size of the output of the LSTM? Oh. Output size of the LSTM? Hmm? Hmm. It's the something size. size. Oh, okay. You said the input size is the no. same as the output size. The input size of the embedding is the same. It would be the input size of the LSTM, yes, but not the output. How many? Uh, what's how many cells do we have in the LSTM? What did we define that as? No. 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 Oh. Somebody said it. Oh, I hear four hundred. So what is that four hundred? LSTM size. LSTM size. Yeah. All right, and one more parameter for that. So we want to output this to a range of classes, and those classes can be numbered as. Where are we trying to have some text, right? So how much, how many different pieces of text do we have? Vocab size. Indeed, vocab size. All right, so that is our LSTM and our classifier. You guys just walked me through that. Amazing. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> All right, so that was uh, initializing our LSTM there. And don't want errors. All right, so let's go through a forward pass of this. So initially, we're going to get our batch size, and we're going to um, get our embedding layer. And then we're going to feed that embedding layer to our LSTM. and. Through that, we're going to get a new output, and we're going to get the hidden state. And because uh, of just the way that PyTorch is, we need to actually flatten this down. Oh, did I see a hand? Oh. So we actually want to flatten this down uh, just because of how PyTorch would like it. 
So this negative one here is basically telling us that we want the dimensions to be batch size times the sequence length. It's a negative one means like an inferred dimension. So pi torch will figure it out what dimension it should be. Yeah. And we're just using our uh, contiguous function to do that. So then we take that and we feed it into the classifier and let the classifier do its magic. Uh, and then we're going to unflatten that just so we can get back with the dimensions we had before. Um, so again, using that negative one again, it will infer that it needs to bring it back to the dimensions. And then we only really care about the uh, output, so we're just slicing here and we're just grabbing that output. And then we will be returning that output and the hidden state of the model. And then just because uh, have how the LSTMs are, we need to initially have uh, a zeroed out hidden state. So here we're just going to define our hidden state to be a bunch of zeros. Uh, so that way the hidden state can be passed to the LSTM. And then we'll be returning that hidden state. And as always, want to make sure we run the cell. All right, we've got some more code that I want you to walk me through. So this is going to be uh, calling our actual model. So what do you think we should name it? Model. How about model? <laughs> and then what type of model are we using? An LSTM. LSTM. An LSTM model. All right. And then what are the things that we're going to be passing into it? So we can take a look up here at what the LSTM takes. Got to look at the parameters here. And we'll go back. Any ideas for some parameters? What do you think we should be giving it? Vocab size and embed size. Vocab size is definitely a good start. We want to give it that. It needs to know how much to train on. And what was the other one you said? Embed size. Yep. So what do you think we should use for embedding size? What's a good number for it? Four hundred and thirty-three. Four hundred and thirty-three? OK. So we said uh, we wanted a range between 250 and 600. So I heard a, a shot for 433. Random number, but we'll go with it. Just <laughs> We'll call it an educated guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then we're going to need to define how many nodes we have in our LSTM. So let's name it LSTM size. And then who wants to shoot out some numbers for a good number for that? Another three. Three. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but we can change. It's a default value, so we can change that. Yeah. It's defined as 400, so we'll go with 400 for now. That's a good starting point, and we can mess around with it later if we'd like to. For the number you were talking about, you said three. I think you were thinking about uh, the layers. layers yeah. yeah. So let's go with that. Let's try. Let's try three layers in here and see what happens. And then there's one more value that we need there. Dropout, dropout indeed. Uh, is anyone hazy on the idea of dropout? Does anyone need a, an explanation of dropout? A refresher? So. <laughs> OK. So uh, dropout is basically, we have this model, right? And uh, we are only giving it one episode of The Simpsons. So a problem with that is it's going to try to overfit. Uh, and it is going to overfit because it only has one episode. It doesn't have that much data to train on. So to try to combat this overfitting, we have this idea of dropout, where it's going to uh, every so often randomly drop some activations of weights <coughs> just to try to combat this uh, overfitting. So dropout can be very important for that. And we're just going to set it to point 0.5. And don't forget to get rid of your error like I did. Next, we have this little chunk of code that's basically just saying if you are using an NVIDIA GPU, then 
use it. <laughs> Don't use your CPU because your computer will blow up. Not really, but it could. And let's throw back to learning rate from the neural networks talk. Who wants to define me what learning rate is? Yeah, exactly. So we want to take some pretty small incremental steps. So that's why this number is pretty small. Uh, this is something that you can also fiddle around with depending on your model and depending on uh, how well it's doing or how badly it's doing. Um, and generally, you can have this 0 0.001 to something like 0 0.0001, where it's taking some pretty tiny steps. Um, but this is a good baseline to start with. Next, we're going to actually need our optimizer. Uh, so we're going to one more time, one final time, work with me here to define an optimizer and a criterion. So what should we name our optimizer? How about optimizer? I like it. Oops. Yep. All right, so thinking back to the things that we imported earlier, how do you think we should start this optimizer? Um, Optim. Optim. And then any ideas for, have you heard of any optimizers used before, some popular ones at all? Adam. Adam, indeed. And then into our optimizer, we're just going to want to pass our model's parameters. And I mentioned something else just a little while ago that we're also going to want to pass into it. Who wants to take a guess at what that is? Is it a learning rate? It is indeed a learning rate. <laughs> Tiny screen here. All right, one final time. We need one more thing here. Criterion. Shout out a name. Criterion. Criterion. And what do we think that's going to be equal to? There is a hint in the comment above it. It is. Oh, okay. We just need, actually, we're going to need that NN function in front of it, and then we're going to do the cross entropy. By the way, if you don't know what cross entropy loss is, cross entropy loss is a, a loss function. Uh, it's called a log loss, and it's used for um, when you have multiple labels, so like uh, multi uh, targets. So as you can see here, we have like 6,000 know, different vocabulary words. So that's going to be able to give us our loss from our predictions to what our, what our output should be. So it's popular <coughs> for using for categorical like classification. Yep. Uh, and then one more time, we just tell the model, hey, uh, if your device equals CUDA, then we're just going to be using this CUDNN, which was provided to us by NVIDIA, to just do some optimizing in the background. That will help out with our training. I think it's uh -oh. learning rate instead of learning rate. Yeah. Dice. Oh, learn rate. Whoops. Yeah. All right. So there is our model. And if we. Yeah. It says that for what? Uh, you might. Hmm. Kaggle might have done a good. Yeah, I can show you. Oh, Kaggle. So it's pretty easy. All right. Fun. So we'll figure out how to actually do that. So uh, you can click, click the little arrow here on the side, so the, it should already be open on the side. Um, go to settings, and then where it says GPU, or accelerator. Yeah, accelerator. Uh, just click that and click GPU. Yeah, make sure we're using a GPU. And then, yeah, turn it on. Now sometimes Kaggle will not, when upload notebooks, it won't automatically use a GPU, so we've had this issue in the past. So. 
It, it, it's going to reload your notebook, so you're going to have to run all your cells yeah. again. So, sorry uh, about that. Fun fact, if you're uh, using something like Google Colab, Google Colab also has the option to use a GPU, but by default it turns it off. Yeah. Is everybody, everybody able to turn the GPU on? Google tr kind of tries to hide the GPU setting yeah. from you. You're like, no, don't, don't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Not all our power. Yeah. So, yeah, and then Kaggle's just going to restart your kernel. Uh, so you can just go ahead and run in. Um, so we're going to vigorously shift enter. Yeah, and get all this uh, stuff. Sorry about that. Uh, can you go where you reload the learning rate? Uh, it's learning rate. We have to close out and go back. Yeah. Yeah. One more time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, yeah, it's going to reload it for you if you didn't have the GPU on. Um, sometimes the GPU is already turned on for some reason. Uh, it just wasn't this time. Yeah. So, are, is everyone good with that? No. All right. Uh, if you want, I can hover over those enter code here parts for a moment so you can get it. Let's go back up. Oh, you shouldn't lose your progress in the GPU when the terminal. It should still be safe. Don't make sure you didn't accidentally open a new copy. Because it'll save the draft for you. Is it still there for you? Yeah. It is or not? It is for me. Oh, OK. Yeah, no, it's still here. All right. All right, great. Cool. Sorry for those little technical difficulties. All right. Uh, not this one yet, but that's. Now we should be using There we go. That's what we like to see. All right, so if we had previously trained this model, then this would be our starting point, and we would load up that pre trained model. Uh, but we have not yet, so we have nothing to load, so we're just going to skip over this cell for now. But if you want to come back later after you've trained the model, this is a good starting point for it. This will be uh, going over a little bit about what I had talked of earlier, the tensor board. If you're interested in using tensor board to kind of visualize your model, then you can pip install and uncomment certain things in the code to use tensor board. But we're not going to be using that here. All right. Um, as previously stated in the lecture, you can use between five and seven epochs, generally speaking. That Take that with a grain of salt. You know, it can be really um, varying depending on your model and depending on what you're doing. But we're going to use seven here just because that fits within what we talked about. We're going to say that if we have a best weight, then we want to save it to this path of best weight. And every time we get a new weight, we're going to want to save it there. And then every so often, we'll be printing the um, current point that our model is at and some statistics about it. So with PyTorch, we have this model.train function. And this is basically <coughs> just saying, hey, get ready. We're going to be training some stuff. So I want you to turn on certain things in the background, your optimizer, your dropout. Just get ready for these things, because we're going to be going into training mode. So in this for loop, we are going to, uh, this is going to be representing our epochs. So it's going to be running this main for loop seven times for our seven epochs. And inside, first, uh, like I talked about earlier, we're going to initialize our hidden state with all of those zeros because we need that initial hidden state to feed into our first um, layer there. And then this second for loop here is going to be going through our batches. So we'll be using that data loader that I had talked about a little bit earlier. And then we'll just be running through that. So with uh, the CUD NN, we need full batches. And it needs to be the same batch size every time. So we have this little statement at top that says, hey, if your batch is not of the size that all of the other ones are, then just forget about it. So we have this data variable here. And this is storing that uh, sequence that we were talking about earlier and the targets that we were talking about earlier. So now we're just going to assign that to their own respective variables. So we have our input sequences and our target sequences. And then we're going to be sending those to our GPU. We're also going to uh, get the tensors for the hidden states here. And we're going to be zeroing out our optimizer uh, because we don't want to be retaining the values every epoch in every batch loop, uh, we want our optimizer to be new every time. 
and then we're going to be sending our inputs and our current hidden state to the model and then it is going to output us a new output and a new hidden state so we'll be saving it in those variables. Is everyone with me so far? Following along? Any questions? Yeah. Um, I'm getting an error on the code block starting with load equals torch dot load this. Um, yeah, because we haven't loaded anything. Um, yes. Actually, you only run that if you if you already have weights to load in. To okay. Okay. Yeah, so run that right now. Yeah. yeah, so this cell will be uh, once you've trained and you have a model to load up. Okay. This, this will load it for you, yeah. So you can continue the training. All right, so back to here. So now we're going to want to get our loss. And right here, we have this backwards function. And anyone want to take a guess at what this is? No. <laughs> One more time, say it for everybody. I want, I want the, uh, sorry. Back propagation through time. Back propagation through time, yep. So this is going to take our loss and go and backprop it. And then what's right after backprop? What do we usually do? Actually learn from our mistakes. OK, so how do we learn? Step into a better direction. Yeah. So this is basically our gradient descent here. Yes, our step function. So we do our backprop through time. We do our gradient descent. And then we calculate the loss for that iteration. Uh, and then this is saying that every so often we're going to just print out those stats. So it's going to run through all of those batches and all of those epochs. And if we hit a new best loss, then we're going to say, hey, we want to save that model because that's currently the best model that we have. Uh, and that is where we will go back to that other cell and we'll load it up if you had um, run through this and you had a best model. So now we are in the training phase, and we can see a little bit about how our model is doing. You can see this is the current um, number of data points out of the entire uh, data loader that it's sending. And then this, whoop, this is going to be um, the current epoch that we're on. And then this number right here in the middle is going to be our loss. And you'll see it's going to be steadily going down as our epochs go up. And you made the model a little bit bigger, so I'm curious on how well it's going to do. I think it's going to overfit. You think so? Yeah. Three I have layers. a good we'll feeling see. it will. <laughs> yeah. And we'll, and we'll, we'll see like, what, what that overfitting has. I think you have a question. Yes. I'm going to error that same criterion not defined. Oh, did you, did so you uh, type? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, were, we typed out some code in the block of that. Oh, why well, can't I scroll? There we go. Um, all right. Them. In this code block, uh, there there was an area that said enter your code here, and then we defined our optimizer and we defined our criterion, which is going to be that uh, cross entropy. Right here. Yes. Yeah. Didn't you change up that whole when long you, thing? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Did you? When did you pull this notebook? Did you just pull this out? Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, of course. All right. Let's see where our model is at. Um, scroll up. Uh oh. Too far. Too far. All right, so then you can see at the end of this training loop we have uh, that it saved our checkpoint. It took 1.84% uh, of a minute. Weird metric, but all right. Uh, and we had a final loss of about 3.7, which is pretty good um, for overfitting a model. So now that we have that model saved, we're having this other cell that we're going to load it up, uh, very similar to our last cell that was going to be loading up a previous model. So we're going to run that. And before I go into that, I just want to go over this idea of temperature. So because our model is overfitting, 
if <coughs> we were to ask it to predict something for us, it would likely predict the same thing every time we call the model. So we're going to use this idea of temperature to say, hey, give us a top percent of the predictions that you think are correct, and then randomly pick from those predictions so that we get a little bit of variability. It's not just giving us the same output every time. So initially, I'm going to run it with a temperature of 0 so that you can see it's pretty much going to output the same thing every time. And then we're going to pass in a different temperature to see how it changes. So before we go into using temperature and things like that, uh, we're going to set our model to evaluation mode, which is basically saying, hey, remember all of those things that you turned on earlier for train mode? We're going to turn those off for right now so that we can test a little bit faster. So we have this sample function, which is basically going to be implementing that idea that I talked about with temperature, um, just using a bunch of math. And if you're curious on how the math works, we have a block up here that kind of goes into it. And you can see how as we change the temperature from 0 to 1, you get uh, a certain range of outputs. And then once you go from 1 to infinity, it goes farther and farther away from that uh, correct answer that it thinks it is and just starts really getting random. So this will be how we're going to be implementing that temperature. And like I said, initially I'm going to do it with 0 just so you can see what happens. We also have pad sequence. So if we have a sequence that's too long or too short, we want to use those zeros that I talked about earlier to pad the sequence. Or if it's too long, cut it off at a certain point. And then we have the actual generating the text part from our model. So we're going to walk through this a little bit. We're going to start with a seed. Who here plays Minecraft? Who here knows what a seed is in Minecraft? All right. Who wants to give me an explanation of a seed in Minecraft? In simplest terms. It's, a, it's just a string of a set of numbers that saves a certain like set of, of chunks in the world that's like, that are loaded. So if I played Minecraft on my machine, and you played Minecraft on your machine, and we both used the same seed, what would happen? We would get the same base world. We would get the same base world. So a seed is like a starting point. So same idea here. We have a seed, and that's going to be our starting point where we say, hey, model, start with this, and then just go from there. All right. So we have this for loop, uh, which is going to look pretty familiar because it's implementing a lot of things that we <coughs> used earlier in the model. So you'll see things like we're going to be tokenizing our punctuations first. That's very important. Uh, we're going to be lowering and splitting those, and then we're going to be storing it into those arrays uh, of the converted words to integers. And then if we don't have enough words or if we have too many words in that sequence, then we're going to want to use that pad sequence function that we used. And like I said, uh, our initial um, layer needs an initial hidden state to pass in. And we just want that zeroed out. So we're calling that uh, init hidden function that we had earlier to make that initial hidden state for us. And then we'll be passing in our text to the model to make a prediction for us. It's basically just going to be taking that sequence and then guessing that target now. So this will become our new target. And then we'll do uh, a soft max on those predictions to get a probability of which one we think is the best. And we will store that into an array. We'll get our output after all of that. And then we're going to save that output here. And our entire in, uh, our entire string of text is going to be a bunch of outputs separated by spaces. And we're just going to loop through this until a certain defined length. Um, so we're going to pass in how many words we want it to generate. And then it will, based on that, generate that many words spaced out. After we get that entire array, then we're going to want to actually untokenize that because we are currently tokenized. So we'll be going back into normal English, and we're going to store that and return it in the end. Did those functions seem pretty all right, what I went over with temperature, padding, and generating? Any questions? All right. The fun part. 
So like I said just a little bit ago, we want a starting point. So it's Simpsons we're talking about here. So let's start with Homer. Homer is going to be our seed. And we're going to say, hey, we want you to give us uh, 200 words to generate. And initially, let's just start with zero. Sounds pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Homer Simpson does not know. So, yeah, so that, and that's, and that, and try running it again. So let's see what happens. We run that cell again, and so he just, he just doesn't know. Yeah, he just, so, yeah, that's. Let's see, what if we, what if we change this up a little bit? What if he said, well, let's give us 500 words? Well, what's so interesting is, I, Homer Simpson actually says something, and then Mo is the one that said, I, yeah. I just For know. me, it says, uh, it says Homer says, oh, I don't want to get a beer. And then it's Mo saying, I know, I don't want to be a lot of, a lot of life. <laughs> Did you uh, keep your temperature to zero? Or do you have it the, yeah, the default that is? Interesting. So is it repeating anything? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's repeating a lot. Yeah, so that, yeah. <laughs> so let's see what happens now if we change this up a little bit. We'll go, let's say uh, I want 300 words. And we'll go with the initial value we had there for temperature of 0.5. Let's see what it generates for us. Uh, I got a name of my bar. Oh, Mo. <laughs> and you can see uh, it gives us um, a decent script that we have there. So all in all, that is LSTMs and the basic idea of how LSTMs work and how you can use LSTMs to generate really crappy scripts. <laughs> so does anybody have any last minute questions? Feel free to just ask anything, any ideas, anything we I went over that was. I think I might add some stuff too. Okay. Because, um, so interestingly enough, if you notice, it's actually learning uh, different actions too. Because that's in the script, like singing from TV to phone, like what the character's doing. It also generates new lines, so each person on new line. And if you generate enough words, it'll probably generate a new scene as well, which are two new lines. That's a new scene. So, and it, it generates all, it learns all that by itself and actually be able to, to structure the text of like how it is and stuff. So that's just something I find really cool. You know, try try a really large camera. Try like two. Two? Yeah. Right. That Because then they'll just start becoming gibberish at that point. Let's see what we got. Yes. <laughs> Some gibberish indeed. <laughs> flag. Wow. So, so you see, it's just kind of like rambling with a bunch of words. That's true. Of so, yeah, that's true. <laughs> of but, you, but you see how interesting? You see how uh, Bert Bert Reynolds is that a person in <laughs> in Simpsons? I don't know Simpsons. So. You've heard of Ryan Reynolds. Yeah, yeah, we have a question over there. Oh, sorry. yeah, I have a question. So, um, what are the steps you would take to make this uh, model more accurate or give a better output? So, um, one of the initial things that you can mess with is a lot of the hyperparameters and parameters of the model. So um, you can try changing how many nodes it has in the layer, how many LSTM cells it has, how many epochs it's running through. So get more data. So Get more data is a very big one. You can train on all 20, 100,000 seasons that Simpsons have. There's uh, only so all well. The episodes and you probably get a lot, you know, some better quality text with a variety of different characters and stuff. And actually, um, well, depending on how your text is, because um, I've done like you know like other shows, and um, and what I found is that sometimes they'll actually make up it because because the character names have like an underscore in them, but you know there's like character names where he has like spaces in between them and actually start making up names like combining different names and doing different things, so different creating new characters and stuff. So <coughs> yeah, that's how you um, you also want to tune like the embedding size, you know your your optimizer you use, the amount of dropout you have. Using the pre, so this model might really help if you use a pre-trained embedding layer. But you also, we also have a bunch of unique words like the, like Homer Simpson and stuff, which isn't in the dictionary. So you'd have to account for that too. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Of course. That's kind of. This is some. You know, put it back to 0.5. I want to see if we can get some <laughs> good ones here. Yeah. So even though we have three layers, I thought it would overfit. You know, but it looks. I want to try 0.3. Yeah. So That's it'll good. probably get a little bit more. You'll notice see. that if you train this and really overfit it, it'll just start copying lines from the, the show. And it's like putting like this literally this word from word, just copying lines, which we don't want. Let's see what we got. Oh, that is, oh this is a TV here. <laughs> just have to get a lot of the bar. Oh, oh, oh hey, you oh, got no. a beer. <laughs> What's the matter, Homer? I can't believe you. 
So you might want to search like the initial text for these lines and see if it's actually overfitting. But it looks like it's actually this is stuff it's generating. Mo, into the phone. Oh, you should be a beer. <laughs> <laughs> you should become become one with the beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. That's That's funny. Funny. Oh, you can get so much wine. Be the beer. Be the beer. I feel like that's something you'd hear chanted in the frat party. Be the beer. Be the beer. <laughs> As you're chugging from the keg. <laughs> so yeah, I, I encourage you guys to take this home now that you have the model and just mess around with some of the parameters and see what kind of different texts you get. It's really fun to see all the different kinds of outputs you can have. And what's really cool is, is that this model and the way the notebook set up is pretty data agnostic, which means that you can pretty much load up any text and it without base, without this, uh, all you need to change is like the file name you loaded in and everything will pretty much work. Um, you may need to change a few things. But you and there's some and there's where you load initially load in the text. There's a comment to to tell you how to actually load in your own text. But try putting in a book like a Harry Potter book or something like that. Um, you know, then find stuff online and actually you can generate tweets. You can generate you know Reddit posts or something. You know, you can do a lot. Um, and it's and it's I mean, really I nothing about the model architecture really needs to change or how the code is. It's just loading it in and training oh, you should it and seeing some outputs. I highly encourage you to try some different things. They were like perfect scripts. They were really great. But um, you could try you know different temperatures, and you know you might be able to find a good temperature where it actually you know you get some decent results. Um, so that's good for output doing things. Okay. All right, so yeah, we're right at our ending time, so I, uh, we're going to pack up here. I think there, there's